Goldberg. Yes for Jess Herrera from the Oxnard Harbor District. And thank you, Will. And Councilman uh, Rich Rollins. And, and ex uh, retired Councilman John Sharkey, Beverly Kelly. And I think that uh, pretty well does it. So welcome, Connie. We're honored to have you back again. And I'm so pleased. I want to say thank you all for coming um, and, and giving me the opportunity to share one of my favorite local history stories. So I am um, I'm a docent at the Channel Islands Maritime Museum. I hope you've all been there. Um, if not, I brought some brochures. And um, I also brought some flyers on an upcoming event with Chowder. Um, so I'm also a docent at um, Heritage Square in Oxnard. I hope you've all been there. If not, you can go there for tours on weekends and at the Dudley House in Ventura. So um, as you can tell, I love history and art. And um, I was asked by the Channel Islands Maritime Museum to, do, uh, to write up some curriculum for high school students on the port of Wainini when the port developed a new exhibit for the museum. And this research and this presentation came out of um, that work. So I'd like to share it with you today. And I'm going to go around this way to where my story is. All right. So now I call this a father and son legacy because I was so struck by the vision that Thomas Bard had in 1865 and it was finally realized by his son Richard in 1940. I have great admiration for both of these men for their commitment and their many, many contributions to our community and that goes even beyond today's story. And I think you will too after you get to know them better. Now, although I call this a father and son legacy, I dedicate the telling of my story today to Mrs. Mary Bard. She's known by her family and friends as Molly. Being the wife and mother of these two brave men, I'm sure that she was very influential in the events that will unfold as I tell my story. So, I'd like to acknowledge her. Thank you, Molly. Now, this watercolor painting that you're seeing, and I have it, <clears throat> you may have noticed it when you came in by the Rice Krispies, um, it is on display at the Channel Islands Maritime Museum. The artist, William Gilkerson, was given a photo, which I'll show you later, of Bard's Wharf during its heyday, and he used that to create this beautiful watercolor painting. I invite you to go back in time and join me in this scene. Can you find me there? <laughs> I'd like to think that I'm strolling on the wharf with my friend Molly Bard. She would be the one in the, uh, the more elegant looking woman in the black dress. Well, the truth is, as we'll soon see, this was a busy working port, or wharf actually, back in that de those days. And it's very unlikely that two ladies would be strolling along in their finery, but that's artistic license for you. Um, <clears throat> so the other not so accurate detail, I don't know if you can see in the handwritten title on the bottom, it says Bard's Wharf, Port Wainini. And, and uh, in the 1890s, this lively little town was known as Wainima, not Port Wainini, which I'll explain as we go along. Now let's go back further in time, even before this painting um, that we're just looking at, to when our story starts with Thomas Bard in 1865, when he came here young man of promise. So he came to California looking for oil for his employer. Thomas was a brave young man of 24 who had already completed his studies in law and had served as a Union Army scout in Pennsylvania during the Civil War. He earned a reputation as a hometown hero during the war and he caught the attention of Thomas Scott. Is this thing in the way? Can you guys see? Is that all right? Okay, all right. I feel like there's a person looking here. <laughs> Sorry. So he caught the attention of Thomas Scott, who employed him to take care of his interests in California. Well, in the years to come, this adventurous young man would become a prominent citizen and one of the founders of Ventura County and a U.S. senator. Bard's <coughs> employer, Thomas Scott, was the assistant secretary of the war under President Lincoln as well as the vice president of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, which was 
the largest corporation in the world at the time. A man of great personal wealth, Thomas Scott, had been very successful in the oil boom <coughs> in Pennsylvania. Planning to continue his oil development on the West Coast, he acquired over 200,000 acres of land here. At that time, Ventura County didn't exist, but the area was divided into 17 large Mexican land grants called ranchos. Thomas Scott purchased uh, ranchos known as Ojai, Las Posas, Callega, Cini, Cañada Larga, and my favorite, Rancho El Rio de Santa Clara o La Colonia, which was 44,000 acres that encompassed what would later become the Oxnard Plain and Guaynima. By the way, this map that you're looking at was created by Levitt Dudley, and he's a member of, was a member of one of the pioneer farming families in Ventura. And that's the house I was telling you about where I'm also a docent. We will visit his childhood home on the first Sunday of every month. Now, before we go any further, I want to say that I forgot to introduce my assistant, my husband, Bernie. And um, part of today's... <laughs> He does. He has very, <laughs> some very important roles here, and one of them is to engage you in audience participation. So when he holds up one of his signs, you'll know what to do. All right. <laughs> but relax. You have time. It's coming up, but not too soon. Now, here we are looking at the search for oil. Um, I think Mr. Scott was a true American industrialist. And he sent young Bard to look for oil in this barren land that he had purchased out west. Thomas Bard was responsible, actually, for drilling the first free-flowing oil well in California. That was up in Ojai. But <clears throat> oil drilling in Ventura County was not very profitable, as is expected, and the quality of the oil was really up to par. So young Bard was given the task of portioning off and selling Rancho La Colonia, which would later become what we know of as Oxnard and Port Wainini. Soon farming families were migrating here from all over the country and even Europe, and as far away even as Australia, for the fertile soil and the temperate climate. Thomas Bard realized that this was the area was perfect for farming and having a local wharf to ship out the crops to world markets would make the land <coughs> even more profitable to the immigrant farmers who were settling here. When Bard arrived in the sleepy little village of Wainima, he discovered that there was a 1,000-foot deep underwater canyon off the coast that provided the ideal location for a wharf by creating a safe harbor. In fact, for hundreds of years, the native Chumash had used this location to rest during their journeys along the coast and out to the islands when they went in their canoes or tomals because of its safe harbor conditions. They called it Wenyeme, which was resting place in their language, or halfway point. A wharf here would serve the growing agricultural community as well as the new oil industry. And Thomas Bard's vision was born. Now, before Bard's dream of a wharf could be realized, a land dispute intervened with his plans. A group of 100 squatters had settled on the land near the deep water canyon on the very site of his proposed wharf. They claimed that there was an error in the land survey, so this area did not belong to the original Rancho La Colonia that was purchased by Mr. Scott. The dispute became known as the Wainima War. Among the squatters, were the Clanton family, who had been in trouble with the law before and had a reputation for murder and cattle rustling. Some years later, Ike and Billy Clanton would be infamous for the shootout at the OK Corral in Tombstone, Arizona. Luckily, Mr. Thomas Bard was no stranger to face-to-face -face combat. What ensued were fist fights, knockdowns, and a makeshift gallows called for by the squatters to hang Bard on the spot. However, Bard's reinforcements arrived and stood shoulder to shoulder, rifles aimed at the would-be hangman's heads, and the Wainema War ended in a gentleman's agreement without a single gunshot. Get ready. The land title was eventually settled in Bard's favor, and the war was completed. 
<laughs> In September 1871, the Los Angeles Star called it a magnificent wharf, 1,200 feet long, built right through the surf. Thomas Bard laid out the plans for the town and changed the spelling of the name back to the Spanish version, Guaynima, spelled with an H and a U to make the W sound. Previously, the American had been writing with a W, W-Y-N-E-E-M-A. The wharf brought to life the sleepy little village of Wainema, as it was still called. Farm carts filled the dusty streets, and the little town, on their way up to the wharf, and houses, hotels, and businesses sprung up on Main Street and Market Street. I have a quote from the Free Press, May 1891. Wainema is not pretty. Evidently, neither nature or man constructed Wainema as a model beauty. But there is something far better to be said for this little bird by the sea. It is one of the busiest places on the coast. The wharves and warehouses filled with the products of the country are a wonder to the casual visitor. It is all a scene of active life and enterprising industry. The businessmen are all busy and have no time to stand and swap lies. They are continually on the jump. The roads to the town are lined with wagons bound for or returning from the wharf, and they are all carried down with beans. Everything in Wainema is beans, principally at present, lima beans. Warehouses at the wharf have the capacity to store 325,000 sacks of produce. Farm carts came from as far away as the Canaho Valley, which is Thousand Oaks, as you know today. But then it was a two-day journey. By the 1890s, Mr. Thomas Bard had become a prominent citizen. He was on his way to becoming the richest man in the county. He had purchased much of the Rancho El Rio land from his employer, as well as the wharf itself, when Scott passed away for $50,000. He had served as county supervisor and helped to form the new Ventura County. Bard operated his business under the name of Barrowwood Investment Company, which was the name of his home after his first daughter. And by 1890, Thomas and Molly had a family of eight children. So they added on to the one-story house that was built in 1876 to create this beautiful three-story Victorian. In addition to his county-wide civic activities, Bard also made many local contributions. He built Bard Hall, which played an important role in town, housing the library, community meetings, performances, and church services. The building here is the Methodist Episcopal Church, built in 1884, the first church in town, on land donated by Bard. He also paid for one-third of the construction costs. In 1894, the Bank of Wainema was incorporated. It was the first brick building in town and the only one with a cement sidewalk in front of it. The bank opened with $100,000 of stock, of which Mr. Bard was the largest shareholder, with 200 shares. He was also the president of the bank, with Mr. A. Levy as his vice president. Some of you may remember the Bank of A. Levy. A few years later, Levy, who had no banking experience whatsoever, opened up his own little bank in Oxnard. He eventually became the biggest banker in the county with 24 branches. The Bank of A. Levy was operated by his family for over four generations and 100 years. Speaking of Mr. A. Levy, his main business was as an agricultural broker. Right around this time, Ventura County became known as the Lima Bean Capital of the World. Ashil Levy was called the Bean King due to the number of beans that he sold to world markets. When the farmers sent out an exhibit of the beans to the Chicago World's Fair, they won the award for the best beans in the world. Of course, the beans were shipped out by Bard's Wharf. Speaking of the county, did you know that the first county fair was held in Wainema? The main event then was horse racing and betting. The night before the fair opened, there was a grand ball held at Bard Hall, which cost one dollar admission with ladies free. The most notable people in town were there, except Mr. and Mrs. Bard. 
he was a teetotaler and did not approve of gambling either. So, he didn't support the goings-on at the fair. Although it is widely known that he did chew tobacco before he met Molly, he gave up his vices when he married her. Back to the wharf. In 1895, the wharf was extended to 1,500 feet, now capable of accommodating larger, deeper draft vessels. It was known as the greatest grain port south of San Francisco. Can you see the lima beans stacked up on the pile on the cart? If you look carefully on the left side of the wharf, you can see the lumber piled up, which was delivered to the wharf to accommodate the growing community. Well, now that you've seen the photo of the wharf of the 1890s, let's take another look at that painting. The artist gave a pretty good rendering of the wharf, <clears throat> including the lumber coming in. But you can tell that he is not a Ventura County resident because he left out the lima beans. The town expanded due to the busy seaport. Now, I have an article here from 1893 from the Free Press. Last Friday was the liveliest day ever experienced at the warehouses. The receipts reaching 12,659 sacks just in one day. All day long, there was a continuous line of carts extending from the warehouses all the way past the Seaside Hotel. In all, 175 teams came in, consisting of 264 wagons, hauled by 821 horses. These teams, if stretched out in a single column, with but two feet of space between each team, would extend a distance of nearly two miles. Now remember the quest for oil? In the 1880s, oil became more lucrative as a business. The Union Oil Company was formed, and guess who was the president? Our Mr. Bard laid a 20-mile pipeline from Santa Paula to Wynema. Bard's Wharf was the leading oil port in Cal on the California coast at the time. When lima beans lost their luster for some of the farmers, they began experimenting with other crops. Albert Mulhart and Ed Borchard tried out sugar beans which they sent to the Oxnard brothers, who had a sugar refinery in Chino, California. Well, the Oxnards found that the beets had three times more sugar than any others, so they were interested in building a factory near the beet fields. But Bard's vision was to build the factory near the wharf. He tried to raise the funds from his resources back in Pennsylvania, and then he contacted the sugar point king, Klaus Spreckles, who was building his own factory in Salinas. Not having any success with these efforts, Bard approached the Oxnard brothers and offered land and wharf access. But the Oxnards chose a location in the middle of the beet fields, near Woolly Road and Saviors Road, just four miles from the wharf. chose the location in the middle of the beet fields on Woolly Road in Saviors Road, just four miles north of the wharf. And with that decision, the fate of the wharf was changed forever. The Sugar Beet Factory brought electricity and a new railroad spur directly to Oxnard. So some of the farmers began to use the railroad now to ship their crops. Both the town of Wynema and Bard's Wharf were bypassed. Thus, Bard's Wharf became a victim of progress. Bard's banking partner and agricultural broker, Ashiel Levy, originally shipped crops from the Wainimo Wharf, but now he found it more profitable to ship his lima beans by railroad out of Oxnard instead of the wharf. The Santa Susana Tunnel was completed, which connected San Francisco to Los Angeles via Oxnard, once again bypassing Wainima. Wainema became a ghost town as buildings and businesses were moved to accommodate the population boom in Oxnard. At harvest time, there were very few carts and wagons now making their way to the wharf. With the wharf on the decline, Thomas Bard got interested in politics and became Senator Bard, the first and only 
Ventura County U.S. Senator. He was elected in 1900. While he was in Congress, Senator Barr championed humanitarian and environmental issues of the day. He worked to protect the interests of the California Native Americans and California environments. He promoted water conservation and the building of the Panama Canal. Back home in Wynema, the beach was still used, mostly for camping. Senator Barr sold his now deserted wharf and many of his land holdings, except for Bur Barrelwood, his home estate, to a developer. It was 1905, and the plan called for converting Barr's <coughs> land, including five miles of ocean frontage, into a seaside resort called Ormond Beach. Lots were subdivided and sold for $100 and up. Mm -hmm. Wynema would be renamed after the famous Florida resort, Ormond Beach. Mm -hmm. But the plan fizzled out. In 1910, the Farmer's Warehouse Company purchased the wharf. The following year, there was a flurry of activity with 114 ships visiting the wharf. <coughs> this was due to the opening of the Panama Canal, which had resulted in increased shipping on the Pacific coast. The company refurbished the wharf in anticipation of increased prosperity, but it was short-lived as activity decreased again. Finally, in 1912, the wharf collapsed, washing away 700 feet of its construction, sealing the fate of the once active wharf. By this time, Thomas Bard had retired from the Senate. His health was failing, and he had difficulty using the stairs in his Victorian home. So he planned to install an elevator. Uh, in 1912, he decided that it would be easier to just tear down the Victorian home and build a new one, which is today known as the Bard Mansion. Even though the wharf had declined, there was no shortage of community pride among the women in town, including Molly Bard. The ladies sprang into action and formed the Women's Improvement Club. They took on projects like repairing sidewalks, planting trees, whitewashing fences, operating the library, and even keeping stray horses off the streets. In 1914, Mary Bard donated the land and the construction costs to build the clubhouse. What happened? There we are. <laughs> to build the clubhouse. Um, on the site on which the former Methodist Episcopal Church stood, which you might recall the Bard family had donated at the time. The building is still here today at 239 Scott Street, just around the corner from here. Thomas Bard enjoyed his new home for only three years before he passed away. He chose his son Richard to run the family business, the Burlwood Investment Company. Young Richard Bard was at Princeton when his family passed away, but returned home to carry on the family business and to marry Joan Boyd in 1916. They moved into the little bungalow, which was behind the big house at Burlwood. Today, the commanding officer of the naval base has the privilege of making this bungalow his home. Richard also signed up for active duty in World War I. During the 1920s, while Richard Bard was busy taking care of business, life in Wynema hadn't changed much. The dilapidated wharf was only occasionally used by fishermen. The town dwindled down to about 300 people. But on the weekends, Wynema Beach was still a popular destination. Trolley cars traveled down A Street to transport people from Oxnard to the beach. The one-way fare was 20 cents, and it took 15 minutes. At Peacock's Beach Resort, you could rent any type of beach equipment you needed, from an umbrella to a bathing costume. In the meantime, young Richard Bard had gotten interested in a new project, the harbor for Ventura County in Wynema. Where Richard Bard? He should be. There he is. Oh. A little dizzy, but he's there. Um, he obtained 20% of the Farmer's Warehouse Company, which owned the decaying wharf that his father had built 50 years earlier. The Sunkiss Lemon Company was growing and opened two new packing plants in Wyoming. Sunkiss was the largest employer in Wyoming during the 1920s and 30s. Young Bard also noticed that the oil industry was on the rise in Ventura County. 
He recognized the need for a deep water harbor to support the increasing citrus and oil industries in Ventura County. And he began a 14-year campaign to fill his father's vision and his own dream. And I think the book is around here someplace, right? Okay, all right. In 1926, Richard Bard set the political gears in motion, which led to the passing of a federal bill that initiated a Ventura County Harbor at Wainema. This was the beginning of a bitter battle that lasted four years between the city of Ventura and Wainini supporters over the best location for the port. Not the first time that those cities have been added. Bard was publicly attacked and accused of profiteering and manipulating survey reports by anti wainini propaganda. There was even a call to remove Bard from his position as County Harbor Commissioner, but Richard Bard did not back down. By this time, he had invested about $350,000 of his own money on surveys, land purchases, fees, reports, and legal expenses to prove that Wainini was the better location for the county-owned harbor. Ventura or Wainini? That was the question. As you can see from this list, the points stack up on the Wainini side. Wainini had more room for expansion and for warehouses nearby. Harbor conditions were superior here, and the bottom line was that to create a harbor in Ventura would be double the cost. But still, the battle raged between the Wainini supporters and the city of Ventura. Attempts at public humiliation and accusations against Bard continued with a take-no-prisoners intensity. Finally, in 1929, an independent committee approved Wainima as the best site for the county port and called for a bond election of $2 million. <laughs> but the city of Ventura still opposed the project. A suit was filed which went to the state Supreme Court. And in 1931, the act that had created the Ventura County Harbor District was declared unconstitutional defeating Bard's plan for a county harbor. <laughs> Undaunted by continued efforts to thwart the realization of his vision, Bard developed a new plan for a privately owned harbor and formed a new company, the Wainini Dock Corporation. He applied for a loan with President FDR's Public Works Administration for $1,600,000 which seemed like the perfect solution for the community project. In 1934, he received a telegram stating that the loan had been approved. Yay. 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 You got it. <laughs> but once again, opposition from the anti wainimi group rose, this time reaching as far as Washington, D.C. Getting wind of this, Bard presented himself in the Capitol. He met with PWA Administrator Harold Ickes, who accused Bard of creating the project for his own personal gain. In 1935, the PWA rescinded the loan. Thank you. <laughs> By this time, Bard had spent about 500000 of his family funds on the project. Mr. Ickes practically told me I was a crook and a liar yesterday. He said the project was clearly nothing but speculation, and the government couldn't lend its money for private individuals to profit by. Seeing how obsessed he was, I didn't prolong the subject further. Never at a loss for new solutions, Richard Bard tried to make a deal with the city of Ventura. He offered 247 acres of land and all the rights of way if the city would build a harbor at Wainini. After their refusal, he turned to the city of Oxnard. He readily accepted. Thus, the Oxnard Harbor District was formed, encompassing Wainini, 
Oxnard, Camarillo, Somas, Newberry Park, and a cent to the PWA for a grant of $783,000. Both the Telegram and newspaper headlines announced the approval of federal funds. Yay! But once again, the federal government turned down public funding for a harbor at Planini. In a last-ditch attempt to raise the funds, the Harbor District called for a special election for a bond issue of $1,750,000, which was fully subscribed by 1939, finally. Yay! Port of Wainini would be the first harbor in American history to be constructed without one cent of federal money. At the groundbreaking ceremony, Richard Bard was hailed as the father of Port Wainini before a cheery crowd. In his speech that day, he said, Looking back on 14 years of ups and downs, mostly downs, in our effort to establish a harbor at this locality, it seems almost unbelievable it is now an actuality. Dredging started in 1939 while the nation was still in the grip of the Great Depression. The Harbor of Dreams, funded by the residents of the community, was finally constructed. The next year, the port was completed and opened on July 6, 1940. Opening day was a gala celebration, and the little town of Wainini awoke from its deep sleep, changing its name to reflect its new status to Port Wainini. The Harbor District received a telegram from President Roosevelt on opening day. A bit ironic. Hearty congratulations to the community of Oxnard on the fine enterprise which has prompted them out of their own financial resources to create the new harbor of Port Wainini. But the ups and downs that were destined to be a part of the story of Port Wainini were not over. On the same day of the opening celebration, the port was closed due to a labor dispute with the Longshoremen's Union. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the dispute was settled and the port got off to a slow but steady start. That same year, the port was selected by the U.S. Maritime Service as the site for a new training vessel that would inhabit Dock 1. The ship, American Sailor, came to port in August 1941. Just four months later, Pearl Harbor was bombed, and once again, the path of the port's destiny took a turn in another direction. 1942 opened with fear and blackouts along the coast of California after the sinking of a Union oil tanker in local waters. The Coast Guard was on alert, and tension was intense. In an ironic turn of events, the U.S. Navy took over the port that the federal government had repeatedly refused to fund in its development. The Harbor District offered a lease to the Navy, but Uncle Sam took ownership of the entire port by paying off the bond indebtedness. A pretty good deal, according to Fortune magazine. The CD base at the port made a tremendous contribution to the war effort, moving more than 7.5 million tons of war material, utilizing over 1,000 ships and employing 12,000 people. Port Wainini shipped 25% of all war supplies to the Pacific. By the way, Richard Bard signed up for active duty again during World War II. At the end of the war, thousands of returning servicemen and women came home through the naval base at the port of Wainini. With the war over, the Harbor Commission began negotiations to lease back a portion of the port for commercial use. In 1948, the Harbor District acquired use of Dock 1 again, serving the fishing and construction industries and general cargo. In the picture at the right, Notice the lumber being lifted, reminiscent of the early days of Bard's War. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, oh, there we go. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, 
board operations were expanded. To this day, the Port of Wyoming continues to enjoy a joint partnership with the U.S. Navy and the Harbor District, serving both government and commercial interests. In the 1960s and 70s, the largest port customer was the offshore oil industry, shipping equipment and supplies out to the oil platforms in the Santa Barbara Channel. This was a Thomas Bard's original plan in the 1870s, which was brought back to life by his son Richard 50 years later, and finally realized a hundred years later. Yay. In 1977, the first imported cars arrived here. Notice the method of transporting the auto from the ship to the dock. Since then, more than four million autos have transited the port, and the cars are loaded much more efficiently. The 1970s also saw the beginning of the fresh fruit import and export operations with the Del Monte Tropical Fruit Company. By 1985, from 1985 to 2003, the port was continually expanded to support the growing import and export operations and was designated as an international port of entry. Today, the Port of Wainini is one of the biggest and busiest banana gateways in the country, importing more than 3.3 billion bananas a year. Enough bananas to circle the earth 13 times. The Banana Festival in September of 2017 brought 12,000 people to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the port. You won't want to miss this year's event on September 28th. It's the last Saturday in September. The port ranks among the top 10 U.S. ports for the import and export of automobiles, handling over 300,000 autos a year on road road ships, rolling on and rolling off. Transport of autos provides 60% of the port's operating income. The Port of Wyoming has come a long way from Bard's Wharf. Bard's Wharf. There we go. <laughs> Built to ship out crops by local farmers almost a century and a half ago. Port operations today surely have surpassed the dreams of both Thomas and Richard Bard. They would be proud of their legacy to the community if they were here today. As I mentioned before, I did the research um, as part of my work at the Channel Islands Maritime Museum, and I invite you to um, go to the museum and explore the exhibit there to see more about port operations today. It's on the upper deck overlooking our beautiful Channel Islands Harbor. And besides that exhibit, the museum contains many other treasures of both art and history. Um, as I mentioned, I brought some uh, brochures. So um, I want to thank you for hearing my story. And if you're interested in reading up more on this topic, here are my resources and um, also the place where I got so many of um, the pictures that I used. Um, and I just want to mention some of the things that I put over there. Um, this is the brochure from the Channel Islands Maritime Museum. And did you know that there are 32 museums in Ventura County? They're all in this, well, not all, because this adorable little museum is not. Um, but it will be next year. Um, Oxnard Salsa Festival, you don't want to miss that, July. And the Heritage Square Concerts. And, um, and lastly, if you're interested, I do living history presentations. And um, I started with one, um, Lucy Levy, who I've done here. And I, I now have, uh, I think, 22 different living history presentations. Some I, I, I will, I'm always in con uh, costume. Some I'm actually in character, and some I deliver in this way. Um, so if you're interested in having any of those at a venue, or if you have, belong to a club, I can give you one of these. So thank you again. This was a treat for me to be able to tell this wonderful story about Thomas and Richard Bard and their accomplishments. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Oh, oh, I told you everything I know. How busy was the port for the Vietnam War? That's a good question. Does anyone here know the answer? It was extremely busy. Well, what, what, what's your particular, I mean, what, what are well, you? Well, not like World War II, I mean, but how busy did it get here? I mean, did they take over a lot of the commercial war? No, they were using mainly the, uh, the Navy side, but it was extremely busy. They had uh, the longshore terminals, they had like 22 gangs working day and night, which is a lot of people, which is probably two or 300 people per ship working around the clock. And more, uh, more material was shipped out of here than anywhere else during the Vietnam War for that effort out of the Port of Wainini. It was continually busy. More than Long Beach, huh? Yeah. Well, the, because you have to go back to the origin of why this, why the longshoremen are here and why the Navy uh, supported the long, uh, the uh, ILW, which is the Longshore Union, and that was World War II because Admiral Ben Morrell created the uh, the Seabees, and then he realized that with the use of all these construction men in the South Pacific, he needed a workforce here to supply them. So he went to uh, Harry Bridges, who was the West Coast labor leader at the time in San Francisco, and said, we need longshoremen in the port of Wainimi. So Harry told Admiral Ben Morrell, well, yeah, let's win the war. So he brought a group of longshoremen here. They were trained. The Navy, as a matter of fact, the Naval Civil Engineering Lab used to be the South Terminal that we have today. And they, the Navy built the hiring hall for the longshoremen on Navy property because they wanted them there and, and easily available to go to work. So uh, ever since then, you know, uh, World War II, you know, Korea, Vietnam, it's been that, that relationship between the, the Navy and the ILW, the Longshore Union. As a matter of fact, we're interested in, in creating a memorial to Richard Bard as well as to the the joint uh, efforts of the Navy and the Sea, and I mean the ILW and the Navy uh, during that period of time. So, uh, with the city of Wainimi, my fellow mayor, <laughs> we're working on trying to make some of this stuff come true, and so we can have some living history uh, examples along the promenade. Thank you. Those big ships that bring in cars, how many will those ships hold? How many cars? I think is it nine thousand. Depends on the on the size of the vessel, but you know, an average an average load would probably be about three to four thousand to this port, but they can't hold much more. They can't hold about seven or eight thousand. Do you want questions? Okay. We usually uh, pass the hat because we don't get any money from the city, so we're going to Johnny. Hold the sign up. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. By the way, you guys were great on the audience participation. <coughs> I, I put that in at the end, so just in case we're starting to doze off. As soon as John left, it went down. I tried to tell you. I'll take for Mr. Mayor. That's a good question. I think they had a